Okay, so I was talking about the Beatles. So unlike, uh, unlike many of you, I was in front of the television set age 12 uh, in the 60s when the Beatles burst on the scene, broke into North America. And you remember that, Joe? <laughs> and m more revolutionary than their music, she loves you and I want to hold your hand, was really their challenge to the binary definition of gender. Look how long their hair is, you know? Are they boys or are they girls? That was, the, that was what I heard from my parents and their generation. <laughs> but had, had, had that generation been better versed in Shakespeare, in Shakespeare, they would have recognized that in the 1500s, Shakespeare was written, wrote in his 20th sonnet, recently put to music by Rufus Wainwright, um, about this very issue. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted, hast thou the master or is it mistress of my passion? You like the next line. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change as is false woman's fashion. Um, moving down, and for a woman wert thou first created, till nature, as she wrought thee, fell a doting, means made a mistake. Also in the Aboriginal culture, um, the, those who were two-spirited, who were seen as having qualities of both genders, were actually celebrated. They were seen to be more mystical, and often became the shamans of, of, their, of their cultures. She was a remarkable woman, a fine blanket and sash maker, an excellent cook, an adept in all the work of her sex. And yet, strange to say, she was a man. If we fast forward to today, we have people who are struggling with their gender identity encapsulated in a DSM-4 diagnosis. The, the definition is here. It's going to change in DSM-5, but it's worth, it's worth noting. Strong and persistent cross-gender identification and a persistent discomfort with their sex or a sense of inappropriateness in the gender role of that sex. Now, there's significant debate over whether people who have gender identity issues should, in fact, be encapsulated in a diagnosis or not. Uh, like homosexuality, many would argue that it's a natural variant and therefore shouldn't be a diagnosis. However, those who, who argue in favor state that because it's a diagnosis, it entitles these people to the clinical care, the research dollars, and the advocacy that's commensurate with other diagnoses. Those who oppose suggest that the, the diagnosis in itself um, uh, indicates that the distress derives from the abnormality of the condition itself rather than from what might be a reaction to the transphobia that these people experience within their families and within society as a whole. It was better, it was better described, I feel, by uh, Wallander in 1968, who, in reading these four points, one gets a sense, one, one can begin to empathize with the terrific struggle that these people uh, uh, deal with. A sense of having been born into the opposite sex, of having been born into the wrong sex, of being one of nature's extant errors. That's a very, very powerful statement. Imagine feeling that, that that relates to yourself. A sense of estrangement with one's own body. All indications of sex differentiation are considered as afflictions or repugnant. Think of the young child who feels that they're in the wrong gender as puberty approaches, as the voice begins to drop, as the hair begins to appear on the face, or as the first indications of menstrual function emerge. Think of the distress that that would uh, cause somebody who would qualify for this second category. And Margaret will allude to this uh, a little bit later in terms of when one initiates hormone therapy. Is it better to initiate it pre-puberty to avoid this distress or, or subsequent to puberty? And, and that will be discussed further. The third is a strong desire to resemble, resemble physically the opposite sex via therapy, including surgery. And finally, a desire to be accepted in the community, accepted in the community as belonging to the opposite sex. This, so rather than, than think of it in terms of gender identity disorder to avoid the debate about diagnosis, I think it's useful to think about it as gender identity dysphoria. Mommy, God made a mistake. That's a four-year-old talking. Mommy, when will my penis fall off? This reflects the angst associated with feeling trapped in the wrong body. It's a clash between who I know myself to be and of what others see and expect of me. It's choosing to be true to one's own self, even at the risk of rejection by your own family. It's having to cope with a non-understanding, non-welcoming, and often overtly hostile environment. That's gender identity dysphoria. 
for all teenagers, all adolescents, the goal is to successfully um, uh, adjust with adolescents and become successful adults. In order to accomplish this, we, we often discuss it in terms of uh, tasks of, of uh, uh, adolescent accomplishment. They need to attain a true and positive sense of themselves. Who am I? But more importantly, I'm, I like myself. I'm proud of myself. They need to have a successful transition or launching by their families where the message is from parents to child, we believe in you, we trust you, we think you'll do okay. They need to have experienced successful, successful relationship with peers, uh, leading ultimately to intimacy, emotional intimacy as well as physical intimacy. And then, and finally, school success. They have to do well in success so they can be positive and confident that they'll be able to support themselves and possibly families, if that's their choice, in the future. We know for all adolescents that problems emerge when these tasks are not satisfied. When a young person is unable to accomplish any of these tasks, that's when the typical problem behaviors emerge. If you think about gender identity dysphoria, which of these tasks is adversely affected? Identity, pretty obvious. Family rejection, common. Isolation, bullying, victimization by peers, it's the rule. And, and if you're so distressed so unable to sit in your classroom because you're worried that people are going to bully you or tease you, and you're, how, how can you possibly accomplish math and history? So all four, all four tasks are at risk. And therefore, it's no surprise that when we look at populations of, of people who are transgender, as did Clemens Nolan in 2006, we find that there's a very, very high rate of, of significant maladjustment. Um, in this population, 13% was below the age of 25. Half of them were unemployed. A quarter hadn't finished high school. 60% were depressed. 28% were in alcohol or drug treatment, and that doesn't even talk about the ones who were substance abusing and not in treatment. 62% um, had been raped. 83% verbal gender discrimination. 36% physical gender discrimination. And look at the suicide rate, 32% suicide uh, attempt, 32% in the overall population. But if you look at the, only the under 25, it was actually 47%. These people are struggling. There are many barriers that, that are present in limiting or, or interfering with their ability to access health care. And I would, I would put shame as number one. Remember what I, what I was referring to in terms of identity and the, the importance of having a positive identity. These people grow up feeling that they were a mistake, that God made a mistake. It leads to tremendous deep-seated shame, a sense of unworthiness, self-hatred, and often self-injury, and, and ultimately leading it to, into reduced self-care. They have a perception of isolation. It's not only a perception because it's often real. They're often isolated from their peers, isolated from their families, and isolated from us, from the healthcare system, because they don't know where to turn. And many healthcare providers really aren't ready or prepared to, to uh, deal with this issue. Um, many will have lost the parental uh, endorsement. So rather than their parents <coughs> saying, we believe in you, go for it, you'll do a good job, many of these young people have to actually leave the home or feel deprived of that parental um, endorsement. Losing parental endorsement often also means losing funding, which means that they may have to struggle to find a roof over their heads. They may have to struggle to find uh, dollars for the medication or procedures that they will ultimately need to undergo and, and become therefore very dependent on others to support them. Unfortunately, those others that support them don't necessarily have their best intentions in mind. So there are many threats to health and, and they, they fit pretty well under the heading of, pover of, sa of safety. Young people who, are, who don't have access to, to dollars or to shelter will often rely on uh, a sugar daddy of some sort to provide for them. Well, those people, so automatically they're now in a dependent, vulnerable position. And the result, as you saw in a previous slide, is that there's a, a high degree of exploitation. Many are involved in the sex trade, possibly to support themselves. They have no, often have no education, no jobs, sometimes to pay for interventions. And, and sometimes just to validate their transgender sexuality, because where else can they do it? Um, safety, as I mentioned, is a big issue. Substance abuse is prevalent. 
and is often used as self-medication, and, and of course suicidality 